Record. All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Lieutenant Sean Olagi. I'm with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Advanced Hunter Education Program. And our Advanced Hunter Education Program is here to uh, help you with the how-tos. It's not for really advanced people. It's not anything like that. It's beyond hunter education. So in, the, in regular hunter education, you get the steps and the, the knowledge that you need to safely enter the field, uh, learn some of your responsibilities of a, as a hunter. But in our advanced hunter education program, it's for the how-tos of how to do things. So um, thank you for joining us for our webinar. If you uh, like what you see here, we do have recorded webinars on different topics on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm gonna be sending link out, uh, links out to you after this webinar. Uh, but basically referring you to our advanced hunter education page. Uh, for there, you can, you can see upcoming events, you can see past webinars, and uh, there's actually a survey there too that I really do appreciate. If you have any comments, to please fill that out too, because uh, this is driven by demand. Whatever your demand is, I try to provide it, and I uh, thank you for coming on and, and doing that thing. All right, so we are recording. Uh, as you all know, I like to start with polls just to get an idea of what your experience is as far as uh, where you come from and what you uh, like to do. And I am going to launch it. I've incorporated the jokes again, so hopefully you can help me out with that. Um, wrote them myself, so we'll see what happens. So the first question is, have, I have taken the following dove. Uh, fill out all that apply. It is the morning dove, the white wing dove, and the Eurasian dove. Fill out all that apply there, please. My joke, uh, I didn't write this one. This is one I didn't write. So if you think Thursdays are depressing, just wait two days. It'll be a Saturday. All right, some people like it, some people say not funny. I appreciate that. We'll give it a couple more seconds and uh, go five, four, three, two, one. We'll end the poll and I'll share the results. And so our results show that 85% of you have bagged a morning dove, 24% have bagged a white wing dove, and 53% have bagged Eurasian doves. And 79% uh, thought this joke was okay. So not bad. All right, next uh, poll is uh, asking about your hunting experience. Um, I'm going to launch it. I have hunted specifically for dove zero to five times, six to 15 times, or more than 15 times. So I wanna see what our disparity is here as far as people, where they come from. And my joke is, why did Dove Hunter win an award? He was outstanding in the field. Ah, I'm doing well. Maybe I should take up, a, this one I wrote. I should take up a, a, thing out, a, a comedy career, huh? All right, well, thank you. Here we go, we have, uh, more, more of you guys, only five that didn't participate, and I'm going to end the poll. And here it is, uh, share the results. So it says here that 45% uh, have hunted from zero to five times for dove, 13% have hunted six to 15 times, and 43% have hunted more than 15 times. And I got an overwhelming 90% funny, so thanks. So we have a little bit of uh, uh, some of the rookie class and then some of the really experienced. So if any comments that you have tonight that will help me uh, get that, uh, get some knowledge out to everybody, please mention it or ask the question leading us to answer something, that would be great. All right. I don't know if I shared the results, but I'm gonna go into the next, the next poll. I'm going to launch it, and here it is. Uh, have you or will you apply for any DFW dove hunt? The deadline is August 11th, which is next week. Um, we covered a webinar on this earlier in the um, year, maybe a month, 
and a half ago, somewhere around there. Um, nobody's responding. And the joke, uh, one joke, why was the white wing jealous of the red wing? The red wing was a boot and the white wing was just a bird. Okay, it's not doing so well. <laughs> and then the next joke, what do you call a long line of flying morning dove? A procession. Okay, some people might not get this. You know how when there's a funeral, there's a line of cars. These doves are all mourning. There's the joke. <laughs> all right. So we have a couple more seconds here. I'll give you a five, four, three, two, one. And the poll, and I'm sharing my results. All right, so uh, as of the attendees, 34% uh, said, said they have or will attend for uh, apply for the dove hunts. That's good. And 66% of you already have a place to go, I guess. So that's great. I'm glad you have a place that uh, you don't have to apply for our DFW lands. Uh, jokes were so-so, 54% on the Red Wing and 66% on my morning dove. So I still got to keep my day job. All right. So let's get rid of this poll. Not seeing any questions yet. And just a couple of comments, nothing big. All right, let me share my screen and we're gonna go ahead and get started with this webinar, the meat of it. Um, let me get out of this real quick. I think I've done this a couple times from the beginning. Start right there, share. Share screen, and here it comes. All right, I think I'm on top of it, so here we go. So we're gonna talk about California dove hunting. Uh, they, I asked for pictures from some of our game wardens and some of our hunter ed instructors who are out there, and I tried incorporating at least one or two of what you had presented to me, so thank you for helping my program. Um, we're gonna to talk tonight about uh, why dove hunt. What do you, what's so significant about dove hunting? We're gonna talk about the seasons. We're gonna talk about laws and regulations. We're gonna talk about methods of take, uh, locations and tactics and preparation for eating. A lot of people don't understand, uh, you know, what is there to eat on a dove? Uh, those of you who've had them uh, know, right? So when it comes to dove hunting in California, we're very lucky in the sense that we have at least three varieties that are out there and pretty, pretty prevalent. Um, white wings, as you can see, are not really prevalent throughout the state. They're basically down in the desert region of our uh, southeast corner of our state near, near Arizona and Mexico. And that could probably um, explain the 24% of you that claim to have uh, taken a white wing. Uh, the morning dove, I don't know why there's any white in that calendar, I mean that calendar, that map there, because some of it's part of Fresno, Madera, Kern, Kings County. Those areas that are there, I know they have dove in them. Um, and then the Eurasian dove, which are we talked about also a couple weeks ago, and very prevalent species that are out there throughout the state, and a great opportunity for, for hunting. Um, another reason why it's so special is because there's many encounters due to high population. Uh, it's a lot more exciting when you can go out there and start, you know, trying to encounter animals. You know, when it comes to doves, you have a lot more opportunities than, say, a deer where you're hoping to see one. Um, with dove, you'll see them. You just might not be in the right spot, but uh, they, they are prevalent and you will have opportunities to, to take. Um, a fact that I found was that the morning dove is still one of the 10 most popular uh, abundant birds in the United States with an estimated fall population of over 400 million birds, which is a lot. It's also great, uh, it's very special because it's the ultimate test of wing shooting, which is the art of hitting flying targets with a shotgun. Uh, a lot of people are very intimidated by uh, shooting a shotgun, and we'll talk about some of the things we need to do in preparation for that. But, uh, you know, it, is, it shows how good you are, I'll tell you, when it comes to shooting doves. Uh, I don't know if they watch your finger 
or what it is, but it seems like they always dip or dive as soon as you get ready to pull the trigger. But uh, accomplishing a limit, which is 15 birds uh, in a box of shells, which there's 25, would be quite the feat, something you could actually um, brag about. Another reason it's so special is camaraderie. Um, it's an easy to share experience, especially with kids and new hunters, or even uh, you can see here, there's a, a disabled vet who has a, um, I don't know what you'd call that, but a mobility chair uh, to help him actually participate in the hunt. It's a good group activity. Um, it was easy to get pictures of groups that were sharing this type of day. September 1st is like one of those days that you get together with your buddies and you go out hunting and uh, it seems like everything's right in the world. Oops. Another reason they are uh, so special is because they're delicious, um, I believe. It's one of my favorite birds to eat. Um, a lot of people like to make poppers, which basically uses the breast meat. Um, myself, I like to have whole grilled uh, dove. Uh, they're all tasty. Uh, biggest thing is, and I might talk about this more later, is just not overcooking them. Uh, there are some recipes you can make sure that, you know, they're completely cooked and there's no pink and they can come out good. But uh, myself, I like, I like them a little bit medium rare. All right. So let's talk about the seasons. Um, seasons are pretty much always the same as far as... Uh, September 1st is usually the start of the first season and it proceeds for 15 days. And then after that, the second season always starts on the second Saturday of November, which this year happens to be November 12th. And I think together they're supposed to be, it's supposed to be a 45 day season. So whatever, you know, day that falls on, uh, it usually ends right around Christmas or Christmas Eve or somewhere uh, right before that, depending on how uh, when that second Saturday date is, okay? So when it comes to the morning doves, white wing doves, spotted doves, ring neck turtle doves, those are the two seasons, September 1st through the 15th and November 12th through December 26th. The Eurasian collar dove, as we found out earlier in the year, or I've known for a while, you probably have too, is that they're open all, all year and there's no limit. All right. Um, when it comes to uh, species, very important that you know your species, okay? Um, especially down for the, you guys down in the Southern, uh, Southern California, out in the desert, out near Blythe or Ehrenberg or whatever's out there. I can't remember all the cities, but uh, basically you have a lot of white wings out there and the white wing is a limiting bird as, as a sense, uh, it has a limit of 10 which is less than your, your legal take, your bag limit. So you have to be really careful not to uh, exceed your white wing um, count. And a lot of people recommend that you try to harvest uh, your five, you know, your, uh, your five morning doves first so that you don't risk the, the, you know, part of maybe taking an extra white wing. You know, if you had like uh, your 10 white wing already and you need the, uh, uh, three more doves, well, if something bad were to happen as far as you misidentifying a bird and you've exceeded your bag limit with 11, then you can have an issue. So we don't want that to happen. Try to maybe single out white, uh, your morning doves first and then take your white wings. Um, the, basically, the Eurasian doves that are there, uh, you can tell that they're, um, they're there. They're kind of your bonus bird. Like a, like a brook trout was a, a bonus fish in some cases. All right, we're gonna talk laws and regulations. Uh, so as far as what do you need to, to get out into the field, please make sure you have your valid hunting license and upland game stamp, uh, bird validation. You're not gonna actually have a stamp. It's a validation printed on your, on your license and that you complete the HIP survey. Uh, it's not required to take a, the hip survey is not required if you're going to take uh, non-migratory birds, but you might as well do it because you don't know what the situation is when you buy your license, complete the survey, get that validation or that completion on your license so that you don't have any issues in the future. Um, 
And as far as method of take goes, you need to have a shotgun holding no more than three rounds and they must be using non-toxic shot. Um, some of the popular shells that are used and I actually use this one right here, Walmart used to sell them for less than $6 a box if you can believe that. Um, I like to use the size six to tell you the truth. It's kind of a very universal size. Um, steel shot does not have carry as much uh, kinetic energy at longer distances. So you have to sometimes increase your shot size in order to uh, you know, maintain that lethality of the shot. Um, I'm not sure what the pellet difference is between size sevens and sixes as far as the count in an ounce of shot, but uh, I don't think it's significant enough and the size six really does do a good job. Um, 20 gauge, uh, size six, that's a good size also. Just uh, realize that you're only hunting with three quarters of an ounce on this box compared to an ounce and there is a difference there. And I just found this kind of amazing that they put the Eurasian collar dove on the, the box of shells. That's, that's where it's gone to. But a word of advice, do not wait to buy your ammunition till the day before the season. A lot of people did that a couple of years past. And as you know, it's very hard to find uh, ammo these days. So get a couple boxes now and get ready for the season. Shooting time, okay, shooting time always starts one half hour before sunrise to sunset at your location, okay? You can't choose a location that's uh, um, more east of you so you can start shooting earlier. Uh, make sure you have the times for your location. And a lot of people, if you have an iPhone, if you look at your weather app, uh, this is what you'll see here, actually, this box right here, it'll tell you the sunrise and the sunset and it'll actually tell you within your hourly um, degree marks, the, sometimes it'll say, you know, sunset is or sunrise is. So you, you, sh you have no excuse to shoot outside of those time zones. All right, when it comes to equipment for hunting doves, um, I used this slide from the last one and added a picture, but I, I really like the motorized decoys. Um, they help me when I'm taking a new shooter. They help concentrate a bird into an area and help set up a shot. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. But there's so many different motorized uh, decoys. Um, I can't see myself. I don't know where I'm at here. Am I on the screen, guys? I hope so. All right, I'm gonna stop my share for a second. That'll be better. All right, so this one's called a dove flicker. And if you've ever watched birds on the um, ground moving from, uh, you know, spot to spot, when they land on the ground, they don't just stay there. They kind of flicker around. They'll maybe flap over to another spot, but that's what this thing's for. Um, it's kind of hard to see. Basically, when you see that little white flash, that's supposed to emulate what a, what a dove is doing when it's in the field, okay? So these are very effective. I used some this actually weekend to try them out on a, a pigeon hunt that I did and it worked really well. Another one is this flapping um, type of decoy. I bought these because they are cheap. They're only 12 bucks on Rogers Sporting Goods. They're normally like 25. Uh, again, use them for pigeon shooting, but this is supposed to, you know, emulate um, a bird landing, back flapping to land, okay? They also have robo doves that spin really fast on a thing, on an axis, and uh, do things like that. We also have just regular uh, full body decoys that you can put on um, sticks, you know, fence lines, whatever helps you to uh, draw those birds to that area's confidence decoys. Uh, you can set yourself up on a fence line. If you have a nice good fence line next to a grain field, birds like to perch, these dove like to perch. If you have a bunch of these on the fence line with a robo next to it, it's gonna give them all the confidence in the world that that's a safe place and a good place to land. And you'll know where your shots are gonna be taken. So really effective. Um, 
gonna go ahead and share again. All right. So the other things that we have that you want to take uh, besides all the you know decoys, the extra batteries for some of the battery operated ones. One thing I didn't like about that flapping decoy is it only lasted for about three or four hours. And I used up three batteries to do that. So not sure if I'll keep using them. Uh, you want to make sure you have a chair, stool or bucket to sit on, a cooler for your game and for your drinks. I guarantee if you put your doves on the ground, red ants are gonna find them. Almost every place I've been to, I put my birds on the ground, red ants will find them. So try not to do that. Take some mosquito spray, uh, some sunscreen, wear some safety glasses, okay? Safety glasses, earplugs, a nice wide brim hat, protect you from the sun. Uh, those, those are recommended. When you're dressing your clothing, make sure you're dressing in drab clothing. Uh, you're not trying to uh, grab too much attention to yourself. Entering or coming from the field, if you want to put on some blaze orange to keep people from shooting at you, because uh, when you're moving out of the field, you're moving maybe in somebody's line of fire that they don't think is there. Very important that you maybe wear some blaze orange when you're moving through on the outside perimeter of the field. Layers, very important to have layers. Um, just that will protect you from the sun, protect you from the bugs. As I mentioned, a good hat. So big question is, how do we get these things? All right. You can look at this dove right here. He's already doing an evasive maneuver. He's dipping or diving, and you're going to miss him. That's what happens when you go dove hunting. Okay. They, it looks like he's looking you straight in the eye, and he knows when you're going to pull that trigger. So very important that you practice with your shotgun. You need to get out to the range and practice shots you'll likely experience in the field. You know, you don't want to shoot a trap field where you're shooting that going away target all the time. That's not going to help you. You'll be more better off at a skeet field or maybe a, a five stand where you have a variety of targets that are launching from different angles, maybe coming in at you, maybe coming from behind your head, going across you all those different shots that you're gonna experience with a dove hunt that are uh, more likely to be experienced than just uh, somebody throwing targets straight away from you. That, you know, these dove aren't leaving from your feet, they're coming from somewhere else, okay? So try to uh, practice the shots that you're gonna get. All right. The other important part when it comes to dove hunting is setting up your shot. I already mentioned it a little bit, uh, but using decoys, uh, putting them out in the field. Um, these are those dove flickers. They don't shine like that, but it's supposed to show that it's a flash there in the field. Here's a regular robo dove. A lot of times you can find those for about 30 bucks somewhere on sale, maybe $40 regular price. Uh, very effective. Uh, they help really, I mean, if there's a dove out there and they're interested, they're going to see this, they're going to want to come right to it. So you can set up your shot. Hey, if they come through in this zone, I know that I can retrieve it because the ground is nice and clean there. I can maybe mark it because it's going to be within so many feet of my decoy. But just really, before you actually take any birds, make sure that you're setting yourself up for recovery of them too. If you're next to some really thick cover and a dove flies over that and you shoot it while it's over that thick cover, you're maybe just wasting a bird. So try to uh, avoid that. In, in your your dove hunts. All right. Somebody asked, do duck mojos work? Um, I would say probably so. I actually use my dove mojo for duck hunting because uh, I'm cheap. The dove mojos cost, like I said, 29 bucks. And like the mojo teal is like 60. And they are the same basically parts. Uh, they just have a different body covering them. So um, the wing size is the same, the motor is the same. Um, so, you know, they probably work interact, uh, you know, uh, intermixed with different applications. All right. So uh, another thing that we have is, um, gosh, how come I can't get this right? Oh, here we go. Uh, make sure your plans on the fire are safe. 
okay? Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't understand what you're doing when you're dove hunting. Maybe it's their first time, but like they think, oh man, all the doves are in the field. How come nobody's out there in the field? That's where all the doves are. Well, a lot of the experienced dove hunters know that if we stay along the edge of the field and we just get in a line, everybody knows where their zone of fire is and you don't have to worry about shooting into the field or shooting out of the field because things should be clear. Everybody should be in a line. But when somebody enters into that field and they're sitting out there in the middle of it, now they've just cut off your zone of fire and now you can't safely shoot out a bird that's you know, gone over your head and, and going out into the field. So very important that you watch those low swinging shots. It's best to have sky underneath your bird. That way you're not swinging on somebody. Uh, dove season results in a lot of peppering, unfortunately. That's probably the, the biggest uh, um, hunter casualty period time for uh, fish and wildlife wardens is dove season, okay? There's almost always a peppering, if not something worse out in the field. And it's from people getting too excited and not paying attention to their zone of fire and maintaining a, a you know, blue sky be, be below the bird, okay? So try to avoid that. We don't want to have anybody lose an eye. That's why we want to ever see everybody wearing eye protection. It makes a big difference. So besides that, be observant. When you're on the field, the, if you're scouting or if you're in a field and you're hunting, actually pay attention to where the birds are coming from. They're most likely going to use that avenue going to coming in and going out of the field. So if you're not in that right spot, uh, make a move unless somebody else has it. But uh, usually it's a certain piece of cover or something that's going on, maybe a pole line, maybe a higher tree, maybe a dead tree. There's something they usually focus on when they're moving somewhere and you want to put yourself right underneath that uh, route if, if you can. All right. Make sure your game is recoverable. I already talked about this a little bit. I actually wish this dove, I don't know if you can see it, there it is, is was a little bit more uh, hidden. Uh, luckily his breast is up, you can see him. But honestly, if you're out there in a dirt clawed field and this dove landed in there, you know, this is your sign that he's somewhere in the area, but you would be surprised how these things just disappear in the dirt. Um, it is amazing, but uh, Use your observation skills. My, my best advice to you is if you shoot a bird and you see it go down, you mark it, try to set up some line of sight uh, marker and you go for it right then and there. Because if you fail to do that, you're most likely gonna lose it. You're not gonna ever recover it, okay? Avoid shooting doubles without a spotter or a dog or some open space in which you could possibly retrieve that bird. If you're shooting them over some heavy, cover shooting doubles is highly discouraged because you could end up losing both of them just from that aspect okay so try to mark them that's that's a good reason to use that robo dove if they come into the robo dove and you shoot them within so many feet of that robo dove you already have a marker there that helps you out otherwise you got to start looking for uh you know feathers uh, this helps you right here, this big clump of feathers that shows that that's where he initially hit the ground and left the big clump and you see the spread so you know he's going this direction. Um, somebody mentioned dropping a red bandana where you think the dove went down. Good idea. A lot of people drop their hat, whatever it might be, you know, um, yeah, blaze orange handkerchief or red handkerchief, your, your hat that you're wearing because you're not sure where that one is. Hopefully they're flapping a little bit because they're not completely dead and they'll give themselves away. But then sometimes you end up chasing them and then you lose the mark of the other bird. So that's why doubles aren't really recommended. All right. Um, what time of day is best for dove hunting? Well, that really depends on where you're hunting, okay? Where your access is. If you're hunting over food or water, or grit, or a roost, uh, or somewhere in between, those may have different time periods where they're effective places to hunt. A lot of the birds, they leave their roost really early in the morning before uh, that half hour of sunrise. You'll sometimes hear them coming whizzing by you while you're standing there waiting for it to be light enough. 
And then when it's light enough, you all of a sudden you see that there's things, these things are flying three feet off the ground and entering into the field. Uh, but, you know, being out there in that feed field first thing in the morning is usually the best. Uh, but after that, there's opportunities to get them going to grit, which is, you know, they need some place where there's some uh, gravel so that can help uh, digest their, the seeds they just took in, or they're looking for water before they go to roost. Okay. Uh, typically, I remember my buddy and I, we used to go to the roost spots, a couple tree lines that we had uh, around 10 o'clock. And that's when birds were coming in, maybe 930. And we, we could have a steady shoot in these roost areas where these birds were coming in from the field and, uh, and coming back to roost. And it made for some nice shooting because they were high birds. They were a little bit slower than that early morning flight. And you could do really well um, taking them. But scouting is very important. Uh, sometimes it requires a little luck. Maybe you're not in that particular area at the right time and right place. Doesn't mean they weren't there or they aren't there. You just hit it at the wrong time. So give yourself a little variance. Uh, come back, visit spots where you think they are because everything's right. You gotta have the right conditions first, you know, a roost, a the feed or the water. And you just might need to hit it at different times to understand. But keeping a hunting journal to recognize those places and spots and times, that could really help because traditionally, uh, birds are very uh, habit oriented. They do the same things, um, you know, like clockwork. So every year, maybe that journal can help you with, hey, I need to be at the roost tree at this time. It'll be good from this, to this you know, hour to the, you know, this hour. And then I need to go out to the water pond and, and sit, sit there for the rest of the day. All those type of things can really help you out. Keeping a hunting journal, very, very easy to help you look up all that information at a later time. All right. Um, next. Uh, somebody asked, have you found any success using a dove call? I don't think it, uh, it helps. Um, when it comes to dove calls, I only like them for location. Like if you're hunting in a roost area, if you know how to whistle like a morning dove, which I could, but my mouth's really dry. I like to tease birds, I'll whistle to them and you'll, you'll hear them whistle back. Um, uh, it's good for locating. Um, so once you locate some birds, they kind of give your, their location up, gives you a chance to jump them out of the tree or the roost and take them. So, uh, but overall, like calling at doves that are flying around, I don't think it works. I don't, I don't think it draws them in. I think your robo, your motion doves are a lot better at that thing. So some do's when you're out there hunting, um, we only got five more slides left, but uh, on some of the do's, leave places you hunt better than you found them. Pick up your spent holes and any other trash you may find in your area. Uh, be cordial and cooperate with other hunters. It will result in a better hunt for both of you. So if you get to that one spot where you think it's yours, you've wrapped it up and you have somebody come in alongside of you, try to work together, okay? Um, because if you're fighting both of each other, if you're fighting each other, uh, it might make for a bad help uh, hunt for both of you. Uh, you'll, you'll spend more time trying to mess him up or him trying to mess you up. It's better just to get along and try to make it work for each other so that you can actually uh, have a good time. And then you never know, it might just be somebody, hey, you never met him. Once you meet him, get to talk to him, realize some commonalities and might say, you know what, this will work. Let's just hunt together. Um, the other thing you want to do is make sure you leave a fully feathered wing or head attached to your birds. Okay. You don't want to clean your birds completely when you're out in the field. It might be convenient for home. Your wife might not, or your you know, partner may not like, uh, blood and dove feathers all over the yard or near the garbage cans. Um, but you have to leave a fully feathered wing or a head attached while you're in the field until you get to your boat. So make sure that happens, okay? Some other don'ts, don't shoot at birds off power lines, okay? They love to roost on those things, but it, 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 it's just not safe. So don't do it. A lot of times you're on a road if you're next to the power line. So that's another reason you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, you just don't do it, okay? 
Uh, do not hunt without permission from the landowner. Okay. This sign right here actually used to, um, in the, our fishing game code, it used to be illegal for anybody to hunt um, if this sign was posted. It says no hunting. That meant for everybody. Uh, I think they recently changed it to where it, it, it's not true anymore. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a bad sign. Landowners would put that sign and say, hey, I don't want anybody hunting. I said, well, that sign means that you can't hunt it either. Uh, you need to put a no trespassing. So anyways, just a little factoid. Um, so get landowner permission. Make sure you have it written. Uh, know their phone number. Um, you know, get those pertinent information that you need in order to either uh, prove that you have written permission because some landowners tell game wardens that, hey, I don't want anybody hunting my property. If anybody's hunting my property, you write them a ticket. And if you're out there hunting their property and you don't have written permission, uh, game wardens will say, hey, I already know this, this landowner already told me that uh, anybody hunting their property, give them a ticket. So um, you don't have the land written permission, I'm sorry, I have to issue a trespassing citation. So uh, be careful of that. Don't sit up in the middle field. Um, all setups should be on the borders have safe zones of fire. And also the lucky birds, you know, who get through the firing line basically will get a chance to eat something and you know, have to make it through the gauntlet again. But uh, that's something that, that you wanna make sure you do. Don't cut off angles and zones of fire for people by entering the middle of the field. Um, don't get a limit in the morning and try to get another limit in the evening. That is illegal, okay? Um, there's a lot of people who Say, well, I only get out once a year and I'm going to try to get as many as I can. Well, that's called double tripping. And uh, you're only allowed one limit per day, not per trip. Okay. Uh, a lot of us wardens have our little tricks to uh, catch people doing this. And uh, we do a pretty good job at it. So don't, don't be tempted. Just get your birds. Enjoy the evening. Uh, you know, make some, cook some doves, whatever it needs to do. Do that. And then do not hunt on a baited field. If you see bait there, if there's something unexplainable, if you see white kernels of safflower and there's no safflower in the field that grew there, you're in a baited field, okay? If you see uh, what looks like a pile string of uh, bait, uh, corn or sunflowers or whatever, it's baited, you need to get yourself out of there because that's gonna cause you some issues, okay? Um, so there's a couple questions here. Um, I think uh, Sean Ely, um, if you could answer this for me. Are the Imperial Dove Fields planted again this year? And what about Camp Katie or Caddy? You there? Let's see if he unmutes himself. All right. And then somebody else had a question. I have a few acres that what are the rules to shooting in an area like that? Basically, if you have a few acres, you just have to make sure you're over 150 yards from any other occupied dwelling to hunt within that area. If you have their permission to do so, uh, you're fine, but uh, make sure you have their permission if there's somebody within 150 yards, even if it's your property, if there's like a house 50 yards from your corner of your property, uh, you still have to give them that safe zone that they're uh, expected to have. If they say, hey, go ahead and do what you want, it's your property, uh, see if you can get in writing because that's something that could come up if, if they start thinking their house is getting shot. Sean, you have uh, any answers for that Imperial Dove Fields? Yeah, so a lot of the Dove Fields around Imperial, are they are planted this year. Um, I haven't been here for too long, uh, so I can't speak to the far past, but it, it's better than I've seen it in the past two years as far as what the wildlife fairy has done. There's a lot of, uh, you know, good sunflowers growing and millet and all that. So I've been seeing quite a bit of quite a bit of activity. Um, and as far as Camp Katie, I'm actually not familiar with that. Um, if you could just describe where that is a little further and then maybe I could answer that better. Yeah, I'm not sure. I just figured it was back down there in uh, the same area. Um, Somebody asked if Yolo Bypass was planted. I do not know. I don't know where. Uh, I don't know where um, Yolo Bypass 
I mean, I, I'm not from that area. I know where it's at, but I don't know what their normal plan is out there. You can probably call the refuge staff out there at Yellow Bypass and uh, see if they did do any dev fields this year. That'd be good. I know they usually have all kinds of sunflower and, uh, you know, that doves love sunflowers. Okay. Um, the answer goes live. Perfect. All right. So we'll go on the next slide. Okay. If you're hunting with dogs, some of the cautions you want to be aware of. When hunting with dogs, they need special attention, especially that first season. It is very hot and dry. Make sure you have plenty of water and pay attention to any pad issues they may have. The other thing you want to do is avoid uh, areas that are high with uh, foxtail. Um, foxtails entering your dog's ear can cause you an enormous uh, vet bill or even in through their nose. There's all kinds of different things foxtails are terrible for, uh, which is one reason I don't like taking my dog out early in the year without uh, moisture having come around because that moisture helps make those uh, foxtails less of an issue. But make sure you, you pay attention to your dog. Don't just use them and abuse them. You need to make sure that they're getting the water, the attention that they need. And if they have any pad issues, you know, the goat heads, the star thistles, that you try to avoid the, to address those for your dog. A um, couple, couple pictures from the instructors. So you found the right spot, right? And you got lucky, you shot your limit of birds and uh, only used two boxes. That's about average. Uh, I was reading somewhere, on average, it takes five to seven shots per bird for most shooters, okay? Uh, doves are tricky. Um, and you think about the size of a dove, um, their body size is only about uh, this big and uh, moving at, 45 to 50 miles per hour, uh, dipping and diving. It takes a little bit of luck actually to get them. So um, yeah, that's typically what you have. If you shoot five, uh, two boxes of shells, that's awesome. Okay, first off, to be able to get that many shots, uh, it'll hurt a pocketbook nowadays because those are costing like $12 a box. Uh, but that's what we're about. We're about there getting out there and having a good, good time. All right, and then be prepared to be amazed. Okay, so um, doves are excellent eating. They are best eaten when they're not overcooked. Uh, there are some recipes where you can cook them in like a gravy or something, and uh, you know you can have them really cooked, uh, you know, fall apart type. But the texture changes, and to me, the taste changes the more cooked they are. Um, there are plenty of recipes on the on the web. Dove, dove poppers themselves are probably the most popular. Uh, it's where they get the breast meat. They'll take it off of the breast uh, on each side. Uh, maybe put some cream cheese, maybe a pickled jalapeno, maybe a fresh one, and they wrap it with bacon and secure it with toothpicks. Okay, tasty, very good, um, not bad. It's easy, nice little treat, snack wise. Myself, I prefer to have my birds. So I'll pluck the whole bird. Uh, cut it in half like a split chicken. And to me, the legs on the on the dove are the best meat out there in the world. I mean, really good. I love eating uh, dove legs. There's not much there, but it's it's worth the worth the effort. So, you know, choose your poison when it comes to, uh, you know, how you prepare your birds, but just know that they are very tasty. They are worth harvesting. They are worth eating. And it's a great, uh, to me, they're almost like steak bites. Uh, somebody who hasn't had wild game, if you cook this dove right, don't overcook it, they're gonna think they're eating little steak bites. So try to uh, share your game with new, new people and get them interested in, in what this is. All right, so I'm gonna look at some of the questions. There's not too many there. Um, somebody asked what a dove field is. Is it part of a club? I'm confused. Um, when it comes to dove fields, what we're talking about are fields that are either planted with grain uh, crops, winter forage crops, the, the seed heads that fall to the ground. Um, doves don't like to land in really heavy cover. They like to have open ground. I found like, I find myself, if, if you had a field that was uh, sheeped off where the sheep came in afterwards, 
uh, that makes a great dove field because uh, all the sheep in there are making the land kind of barren. They've uh, disrupted some of the seeds. Um, seed, you know, sheep off fields are great places for dove hunting. Um, so that's what I'm talking about for a dove field. It's it's not a full like a cotton field or a sugar beet field or a alfalfa field. Uh, birds, doves don't like to land and stuff like that. Um, so answered live done. Answered live done. All right. What temp for the meat? Ah, wish I could tell you that exactly. It's just a matter of. Um, well, you can't really see this slide too, too well. There's a, there's pink there. Um, it's still juicy. Uh, I don't know what the temperature is. I just, I just know by watching, usually what I do when I'm cooking these half dubs like this is I watch the leg here, the end. Once this little skin or about a, a meat right there retracts from the, from the end of the leg, uh, it's usually, it's usually done, okay? Sometimes I'll cook the bone side down first to heat up the bones so that uh, when I flip it over to brown the skin, that those bones are hot and they're still cooking the internal part of the, the dove, okay? Once I get the dove skin brown to my liking, usually it's done. And I've come to find that this is usually like six minutes aside on a fairly uh, medium to medium high heat, so. That's what I've, I've found. All right, um, see local fields hunted heavily in the morning, but see very few hunters in the evening. Our evening hunts, not all that great. The morning hunts are usually a higher uh, action type of activity, but to tell you the truth, those are actually a little bit hard. Um, it's a little bit easier to hunt the doves when they're not flying so much. So I sometimes rather have a slow, steady hunt than one of those super fast hunts that your barrel gets hot and you can't keep track of the birds because they're coming in so fast. That's, that's exciting and exhilarating, but uh, sometimes it's more effective when you get that nice, slow, steady uh, stream of birds that come in. It makes you a better shot. You have more chance to focus and that can be a little bit better. Okay. Stan asked, uh, I find with steel shot, if I know I hit the dove, I keep an eye on it because sometimes they fall a little off in the distance. True, yeah, if you know you hit it, uh, doves have really light feathers. They come off really easy, which is one reason why a lot of dogs don't like them. If you see a puff of feathers, you better continue to watch that bird because sometimes what they'll do is they'll just lose some steam and then they'll just nose dive. So uh, yeah, watch them if you know you've hit them. And then one question here is, can you hunt Indian land? So I can tell you my experience, uh, I have a cousin who lives in Parker on the Crit, which is a Colorado River Indian tribes. They sell their own hunting license there. They have great dove hunting, great duck hunting, uh, quail hunting. I'm not trying to pitch them, but um, this, that, that was a place that actually had a lot of game to be taken. So you have to check with each tribe, uh, each um, uh, reservation, and usually they do provide hunting opportunities. Sean, can you talk anything on that? Um, yeah, so so basically, specifically where you're talking about down here, um, I know that it basically, essentially, yeah, you, you wanna contact them ahead of time and you know get, get your uh, license from them. And uh, they, they do have a lot of opportunities. I have heard some people say that they're kind of difficult to get a hold of, but a lot of times, um, once you do, there's a lot of opportunity, like even deer tags, uh, like you said, really good duck hunting if you have a boat. Um, the dove hunting can be very good. Um, and then, of course, a lot of quail. And they have all different regulations as far as the, the management that we do. But I know that there is a a lot of people that hunt down there will get contacted by the the warden down in that area. Yeah, yeah. The the reservations have their own game wardens, and uh, so yeah, be prepared to be contacted by them. As long as you uh, go to their uh, fish and game office, I think they still call it fish and game office. Um, you can get your permit. Uh, sometimes they'll give you maps and field uh, suggestions. Um, there's just 
a lot of game down there. Um, at least there used to be. I I had a great time down on the crit, which is down there by Lake Havasu, Parker, and and uh, really good dove hunting for white wings, uh, for quail, for ducks out in alfalfa fields. Like there's there's a lot of hunting opportunity in the desert. Uh, Sean, who's a, a desert uh, warden out there, didn't realize, you know, probably like a lot of people think, oh, there's not much a game out in the desert, but, but there is, and there's a lot of opportunity to hunt them. So take advantage of that. Good questions. Thank you for, for asking that. And here we go. Last slide of the night. It's basically uh, our next webinar is August 25th at 6 p.m. It's deer hunting, D3, 4, and 5. Um, this little uh, QR code will get you to our advanced hunter education opportunities, and you'll be able to sign up for whatever you need there. Um, you instructors that are still on the call, remember, you have your own place to go and sign up for, uh, for classes. That way I can, I can log your uh, hours a lot easier. Thank you for... Coming on tonight, uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up unless any more questions come in. I appreciate you coming on. If you missed any part of this, you can view the recording and uh, have a good dove season. I really want to see and hear of any opportunities. If you, if you uh, get any birds and you want to share a story, please email them to me. Uh, maybe we can get them in some of our DFW uh, publications. Um, that's it for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, staff, for helping me out behind the scenes. And uh, seeing no other questions, I, I will say good night. Have a good one.